Good evening. Uh, let me just say a few words and then hand it over to John uh, Coatsworth to do the formal introduction. Uh, the university lecture, of course, is one of the favored nights of uh, the year in which we hear from very esteemed colleagues uh, about their work. And tonight we get to hear from Sarah Cleveland. And just two things to say very quickly. I mean, there couldn't be a more important subject about the world than human rights. I think all of us, uh, each of us reads the paper, listens to the news, talks to people uh, every single day, and it's hard not to draw the conclusion that things are worse than they were, and they're even getting uh, worse all the time from that. So this is a really, really important um, subject. The second thing I'd say is about Sarah. So I, I think it's a given that um, there's a kind of mind a mentality that we have when we're in the academy. We respect ideas and theory, and we're always looking for uh, ways to think about weaknesses in our arguments, and, and we're really trying to be as open as we possibly can to ideas and as we seek the truth. And then there's the kind of practical world where it's really uh, an emphasis on decision making and judgment and, and uh, taking a position and, and uh, trying to defend it, achieve it. Um, and it's usually the case that we don't blend uh, those uh, two ways of thinking. In Sarah Cleveland, you have, I think, the epitome of the person who actually can live both of those minds uh, at the same time. And so as we listen to this very important lecture tonight about a very, very important subject, we also get the pleasure of watching and observing and hearing an extraordinary mind uh, that we're really happy to have in this university. Thank you very much, Sarah, for doing this. John Coatsman. Good evening. I'm delighted to introduce this semester's university lecturer, Professor Sarah Cleveland. The contributions Sarah has made to legal scholarship and to safeguarding human rights around the world through her advocacy work make her richly deserving of this honor. Sarah is Columbia Law School's Lewis Hankin Professor of Human and Constitutional Rights. She's also co-director of the Human Rights Institute at the law school. Like Lewis Hankin, Sarah's life in the law has combined pragmatism with a personal vision for how to effect meaningful change by fighting for the rights of those who have no voice of their own. Professor Cleveland has thought deeply and written persuasively about the role of international law in the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution and about the importance of upholding human rights in times of war and during counterterrorism uh, exercises. Her name now appears alongside Professor Hankins and several other admired legal scholars on the casebook widely used to teach the law of human rights. I'm not divulging a great secret here when I say that Sarah also happens to be one of the most popular teachers at the law school where students literally enter a lottery to take her seminar on human rights. In her classes, Professor Cleveland makes use of her considerable knowledge of government and the machinery of civil society to add resonance to legal theory. Though Sarah excels as a teacher and a scholar, it is her advocacy and her activism that have set her career apart. Professor Cleveland's colleagues at Columbia marvel at her engagement with the harsh realities of human rights violations and the way she has earned the admiration of thoughtful leaders from the ranks of government, military, the academy, and NGOs. Always, it seems, she has been acting to protect basic rights. During her childhood in Alabama, Sarah became familiar with the inequalities and civil rights issues that plagued the American South. As a third-year law student, she joined with classmates and professors in a suit against the U.S. government to end the detention of Haitian revenues at the Guantanamo Naval Base in Cuba. As a State Department advisor, she developed her expertise on the law governing counterterrorism and the principles of international justice. As the U.S. Representative to the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe, today she provides guidance to emerging democracies on the role of law and compliance with human rights standards. 
Professor Cleveland began last year to serve as an expert on the United Nations Human Rights Committee. She has advised foreign governments on promoting democratization, testified before Congress on the consequences of prolonged detention, and, and has been involved in human rights litigation before the Supreme Court. Her list of accomplishments is long and endlessly impressive. I could go on, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time to listen to Sarah's talk, Human Rights Connectivity and the Future of the Human Rights System. So please join me in welcoming the Lewis Hankin Professor of Human and Constitutional Rights and this semester's university lecturer, Sarah H. Cleveland. Thank you so much, John, and thank you so much, President Bollinger, uh, for giving me the honor of uh, addressing this audience tonight and for those very gracious um, um, and excessively gracious remarks. I also want to take this opportunity to thank President Bollinger personally for his vigorous support for human rights throughout his tenure at Columbia and also for his deep commitment to relevant and engaged scholarship. It's your commitment to combining theory and impact from the platform of a university that makes it so exciting to be at Columbia, both for faculty and students, and I would like to thank you for that. Now, this year marks a very important 50th anniversary. And for all of you out there, I don't want to disappoint you. It's not the 50th anniversary of Star Trek that I'm here to talk about. And for the more mature members of the audience, it's not even the 50th anniversary of the monkeys, both of which have much to celebrate. But this December marks the 50th anniversary of the UN General Assembly's adoption of two important human rights covenants, the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which together form the backbone of the international human rights legal system. Together with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they are commonly known as the International Bill of Rights. Last December in Geneva, the High Commissioner for Human Rights launched a year of celebrations to commemorate the 50th anniversary of these two covenants, which will culminate in New York this December. Now, today may not seem like an optimal time for thinking optimistically about the future of the human rights system. As President Bollinger noted, we live in what must be one of the low points in recent memory for respect for human rights. With over 200,000 dead in Syria alone, half of them civilians, the promise of the Arab Spring has dissolved into a dangerously destabilized region more people are internally displaced or on the move as a result of poverty, corruption, crime, conflict, or lack of opportunity than any time since World War II. We are witnessing a widespread crackdown around the globe on core human rights such as freedom of expression and association, and Freedom House has recorded an overall drop in its freedom index for countries for the ninth consecutive year. We're also witnessing clawback by states against human rights institutions from the UK's threat to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights to efforts to reform the inter-American human rights system and the treaty body system that at times seem more like threatened hostile takeovers. And I could go on. Indeed, I thought about uh, naming the title for this talk the human rights system at 50, a midlife crisis, question mark. Is it all collapsing around us? But the news isn't all bad. Colombia is negotiating a historic end to the 50-year conflict with the FARC. Burma is taking nascent steps towards democracy. And Tunisia, with its new constitution, is a new beacon of hope. And after all, the human rights system wasn't created because we live in a perfect world, but because we live in an imperfect one. And my personal interest is in grappling with how to make it better, not to linger on the system's limitations. Anniversaries present an opportunity for reflection, reflection backwards into where we have been and why, 
reflections on the present and where we are, and a look to the future. I therefore want to take this occasion to look at the mechanisms of the human rights system, to look at where we have been, where we are now, and glance at where we should be headed. I'm going to argue that the human rights system has been through three stages, the stage of universalization and internationalization, when human rights as an idea was uploaded into the international system. Second, the age of institutionalization, when the fundamental architecture of our current human rights structures was created. And then finally, the current age of connectivity, in which we need to better develop the substantive, communicative, and institutional relationships or synapses among these structures and between our human rights institutions and civil society in order to maximize the capacity of a human rights system of limited resources to improve real conditions on the ground for real people. In taking us on this journey, In taking us on this journey, I'm going to draw upon my current work from three vantages. My work as the U.S. independent expert on the Human Rights Committee, my role as the independent U.S. member on the Venice Commission, and our work here at Columbia Law School at the Human Rights Institute. Now, because of these various hats, I have to say up front that my remarks tonight are given entirely in my personal capacity, and that nothing I say purports to reflect the views of the Human Rights Committee or the Venice Commission. So let me start by saying a bit about these three institutions. Since 2010, I have served on the Venice Commission, which is an independent expert advisory body of the Council of Europe, formerly known as the European Commission for Democracy Through Law. It was established in the early 1990s to help provide technical support and assistance on fundamental rights compliance to the emergent new democracies in East and Central Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. The Commission's work is not limited to Europe, however, and today it has over 60 members, states from around the world, including the United States, covering a total of 1.5 billion people. And at the request of either states or other entities, the Commission produces expert opinions on the compliance of particular laws with fundamental rights and also advises on constitutional reform. So in recent years, we provided advice on the new Tunisian constitution. In January, I traveled to Turkey on a Venice Commission mission to examine a suite of criminal laws that are increasingly be applied in, being applied in Turkey. Did I screw this up? Uh, to suppress freedom of expression. And in March, we will be considering an opinion regarding the current crisis in the Polish Constitutional Court. Now for my second hat. In 2014, I was elected to be the U.S. member of the Human Rights Committee, which is a body of 18 independent experts who are elected by the 168 states who are states' parties to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The committee is the authoritative body responsible for overseeing state implementation of that treaty. The United States has had an expert on the Human Rights Committee ever since we acceded to the treaty in the early 1990s, and Columbia Law School has a very special relationship with this committee. Three of the five U.S. members of the committee have had close ties to Columbia Law School including, as President Bollinger noted, the great and beloved Lewis Henkin, as well as Gerald Newman, who was on our faculty for many years and is also my co-author today on the Henkin Human Rights Casebook. The Human Rights Committee has three primary functions. The first is a process of periodic reporting. States that are parties to the covenant are obligated to report to the committee every four or five years regarding their compliance with the treaty. They then appear orally before the committee and engage in a dialogue with the committee about their compliance, and the committee issues recommendations to them for future improvement. We then engage in a multi-year follow-up process with the states to see how, to what extent, they've implemented our recommendations, and then the whole cycle continues. 
Our second function for states that have accepted this jurisdiction is to receive and resolve claims from individuals regarding human rights violations. And our third function is to issue so-called general comments or explanations of the committee's jurisprudence regarding particular rights. So in the year that I've been on the committee, we've held oral dialogues and issued recommendations to 20 countries, including Russia, Venezuela, Uzbekistan, the UK, France, Spain, Greece, Cote d'Ivoire, Cambodia, and South Korea. We've addressed approximately 100 individual cases, and we are working on a new general comment on the right to life. Finally, my third hat, the Human Rights Institute, was founded by Lewis Henkin in 1998 to serve as the focal point for human rights scholarship and activity in the law school, and also to serve as a bridge between the theory and scholarship of, of human rights and its practice. And we engage with governments, advocates, and practitioners around the globe. Now, it is well known that UN human rights bodies have confusingly similar names. No one can keep apart the former UN Human Rights Commission, the current UN Human Rights Council, and the UN Human Rights Committee, and this is also true at Columbia University. So the Human Rights Institute of Columbia Law School is not to be confused with the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University, which was also founded by Professor Henkin to serve as the focal point for interdisciplinary engagement with human rights across the university. Now, I can't pretend today to do justice to all of the human rights work that goes on even at the Human Rights Institute, let alone at the law school, let alone at the university. So with my apologies and that caveat, I'm going to simply focus on a few aspects of the work that we do. Both the Venice Commission and the Human Rights Committee are what I would call, are engaged in what I would call a process of norm enunciation, norm transfer, and norm internalization. A major part of what both bodies do is clarify the content of international human rights law in particular contexts. Because rights under human rights covenants are rarely adjudicated in national jurisdictions, these bodies, authoritative supranational bodies, have a vital role to play in giving content and granularity to the meaning of these rules. Enunciating legal norms is thus a core part of their function. But both bodies are also engaged in the transfer of norms, transfer from the international to the domestic plane, and transfer among human rights instruments and mechanisms. Venice Commission opinions evaluate the law of a particular state in light of the jurisprudence of the European system and also the international system. The Human Rights Committee is charged with interpreting a particular covenant, but when we do so, we also participate in norm transfer, not only, in, not only from the international level to the domestic, though that is the bread and butter of our work, but in evaluating the content of rights, we also take account of jurisprudence and doctrine developed in other fora. Now, the ultimate goal for everybody is norm internalization. What Harold Coe has described as a process of repeated interaction between states and a variety of domestic and international actors, which produce interpretations of applicable global norms and ultimately, ideally, the internalization and incorporation of those norms into states' domestic values and practices. The goal is to move states from non-compliance to one-time grudging compliance to habitual obedience. That is what we do in both the Venice Commission and the Human Rights Committee. We engage with states repeatedly and we create structured opportunities for civil society to also engage with states when they meet with us, before they meet with us, and after we issue recommendations. The process obviously isn't a panacea to achieve universal human rights compliance, but it is part of the overall system for achieving that goal. I now want to go back in time a bit to locate these institutions in the broader human rights space. 
And to do that, as I said, I'm going to focus on three ages, universalization and internationalization, institutionalization, and the age of connectivity. Universalization and internationalization. From the ashes of World War II, the world came together to create a global constitutional regime intended to prevent international war from ever ravaging the earth again and to preserve international peace and security. In 1945 in San Francisco, the nations of the world came together to sign the UN Charter, which established the core institutions of the UN system and which also reaffirmed faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and declared it a core purpose of the UN system to promote and encourage respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Prior to this point, how a state treated its own inhabitants was its own affair. But that was changed, at least in principle, by the UN Charter, which internationalized human rights by declaring them a matter of international concern, essential to the preservation of international peace and security. So the Kantian and Lockean idea of rights inherent in the human being was taken from the body of philosophy and from the US Constitution and uploaded into the international system. During this period, we also saw the universalization of human rights, by which I mean the widespread incorporation of human rights norms into the constitutional systems that were emerging around the world and that were accelerated by nationalism and decolonization. But the content of human rights remained to be determined. Thus, in 1946, the newly formed UN Commission on Human Rights, under the chairmanship of Eleanor Roosevelt, began drafting a Human Rights Bill of Rights, which quickly evolved into an initial declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, followed by two binding legal covenants. In relatively short order in this period, a remarkable swath of positive international human rights and related instruments were adopted. We see in 1948 the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, the Genocide Convention, and the Universal Declaration. The following year, the four Geneva Conventions regarding the laws of war. 1950, the European Convention on Human Rights. 1951, the Refugee Convention and then a long hiatus until we get to our covenants. All of these were never again instruments designed to help ensure that atrocities of the recent past would never be committed again. Now the fact that last year we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the UN Charter and this year we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the two covenants makes clear that the process of actual codification of human rights was a long and laborious one. Cold, and Cold War ideological conflicts ultimately resulted in the adoption of two covenants, civil and political, economic, social, and cultural, and their adoption by the General Assembly in 1966 did not end the journey since it was another 10 years, 1976, before enough states ratified them for them to enter into force. So this is the period of human rights internationalization and universalization, but we still had to create the institutions to make these instruments meaningful, which brings us to the age of institutionalization. Here we saw the creation of our international human rights architecture, the web of treaty bodies, international and regional human rights courts and commissions, international criminal tribunals, and other bodies, including the Venice Commission, that together form the current fabric of the human rights system. Now, consistent with our 50th anniversary theme, this period also started back with the drafting of the covenants. And as early as the Peace Pro Conference of 1946, Australia pushed for the creation of a world human rights court, a court to adjudicate claims from individuals and states. Australia argued it was vital to have international enforcement of human rights obligations that were being created. 
This proposal did not receive traction, but Australia persisted. And in 1947, a working group was established to examine the question of implementation. This working group also initially recommended the creation of two bodies coupled, a standing body associated with the treaty that could receive petitions from individuals and states and resolve them through neg negotiation, with, uh, coupled with an international human rights court that could adjudicate claims that were not resolved. But by 1949, the court idea had fallen away due to lack of support from states, and the commission focused on creating, creating a standing body to monitor compliance under the treaty and receive petitions from states and individuals. So by 1950, the basic framework of the current UN Human Rights Committee had been crafted in the body of the draft International Covenant of Human Rights. It was a committee to be comprised of seven nationals of states' parties. It could consider petitions from states. It could review claims between states. But interestingly, the idea of an individual petition had dropped away also and was to be left to an optional protocol that was ultimately adopted in 1966 at the same time as the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So the Human Rights Committee was one of the very first treaty bodies created by the UN system, but it was not the first because the Covenant on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination actually was adopted prior to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, went into force prior to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and so the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination was the first treaty body. We now have 10. There are 10 human rights treaties that have treaty bodies affiliated with them. Most of the treaty bodies enjoy similar powers to the Human Rights Committee. And this has created a great deal of potential for redundancy, waste of resources, burdens on states for duplicative reporting um, requirements, and other challenges. But these, are, of course, aren't the only institutions that have been created. Parallel with the treaty bodies, we saw the emergence of a plethora of other human rights institutions. The European Commission and Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Commission and Court of Human Rights, the African Commission and Court of Human and People's Rights, the Arab Committee for Human Rights, as well as regional political mechanisms. And since the 1990s, we've seen the proliferation of international and ad hoc and hybrid criminal courts. So if you just take the human rights bodies, not including the international criminal tribunals, you have an enormous number of institutions with overlapping competences and jurisdictions. This proliferation of institutions, each capable of establishing its own procedural requirements, each of which, at least with respect to treaty bodies, states must report to, in addition to the Universal Periodic Review and the Human Rights Council, has raised significant concerns regarding, as I said, resource duplication, overlap, and coherence, not only within the UN treaty body system, but also in the wider human rights system. Now, the redundancy in the human rights treaty body system has recently been the focus of a multi-year um, treaty body strengthening process in the UN General Assembly, which was focusing simply on trying to make the 10 treaty bodies interact better with each other and with states. But I think the, pro the, the challenge is much broader. And part of my goal tonight is to open the lens beyond the treaty body system and to think about how to situate that system and our other human rights institutions in the broader human rights system. The existence of these fora, I think, presents an opportunity as well as a challenge. Just as the 50 US states provide opportunities as laboratories of experimentation, so best practices can emerge from our various institutions. But the challenge is how to maximize the potential for learning, for cross-pollination, and for mutual reinforcement of efforts. How to, in other words, out of the patchwork cacophony of institutions that we have, 
to ensure that these institutions function as part of a larger coherent whole, to better link them to civil society and to each other, to maximize their capacity as catalysts for norm enunciation, transfer, and internalization. In sum, how do we make the whole greater than the parts? This is the challenge of the age of connectivity. I think we are now in an age in which strengthening these connections between distinct but related normative regimes, building relations among human rights institutions and with governments, civil society and other actors, including through modern technology, has become imperative to the future development and effectiveness of the human rights system. In this context, I will discuss four types of connectivity, normative, institutional, connectivity with civil society, and technological. Normative connectivity reflects the increasing recognition of the interrelatedness of rights, not just within human rights, but between human rights and other related international legal normative systems. The human rights system has for some time recognized the interrelatedness of various human rights norms. And in, our, in drafting our current general comment on the right to life, one of the questions that the Human Rights Committee is struggling with is how to think about the relationship between the right to life and other human rights norms. But substantive connectivity has moved beyond recognition that rights within the human rights lexicon are interrelated. We're increasingly acknowledging the interrelationship between human rights law and other bodies of law, including environmental law and the law of armed conflict, bodies that evolved historically separately and have often been considered distinct. So the post 9-11 world has focused a great deal of attention on the interrelationship between human rights law and the law of armed conflict. Much has been written about this. I could have given my lecture about this. Uh, but particularly in context of non-international armed conflicts, these are conflicts, wars that involve a state on one side and non-state armed groups on the other side. The law of armed conflict, the codified law of armed conflict, is very, very sparse for these types of conflicts, even though they are the most common conflicts that we see around the world. In wars between states, international armed conflicts, we have four Geneva Conventions with hundreds of detailed articles addressing very specific protections and obligations of states. For non-international armed conflicts, we have one article common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions, and 18 substantive articles in the additional, second additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions for states that have acceded to that protocol. So the law of non-international armed conflict is woefully undercodified, and there have essentially been two, I think, there are two possible responses uh, to this dilemma. One has been, and this is most frequently associated both with the European Court of Human Rights now and some European states, with application of human rights law in situations of non-international armed conflict, particularly when they're occurring on a state's own territory. Very significant, um, a very significant advancement has made in sophistication in thinking about how these bodies of law interact in that context. The second approach, and one that I've been working on as part of a project with the university's Global Policy Initiative, is drawing from the law of international armed conflict and applying it in non-international armed conflict by analogy. Many states have done this as a matter of policy or practice on an ad hoc basis. And as a result of my time in the US government, when I came back to Columbia, I created this project with a steering committee of experts in human rights law and the operational law of armed conflict from three different continents to think about as a practical matter what changes would have to be made, what adaptations would have to occur in order for the laws of international armed conflict to be applicable in non-international armed conflict. 
But ultimately, I believe that neither approach that I've outlined is going to be the exclusive one. Ultimately, the answer is going to lie somewhere in a combination between drawing from the laws of international armed conflict and applying human rights law. But the interconnectivity between these bodies of law is one of the great challenges of our era in human rights law, and it is being confronted with ever greater frequency in all human rights bodies, including those I'm associated with. Institutional connectivity. Technological and global telecommunications have shrunk the world and made it possible for advocates, victims, and norm entrepreneurs to bring their claims in multiple fora, to maximize the opportunity for clarification of legal standards and to maximize impact. We no longer live in a world where the refusal of one court to hear a claim shuts the claim down. Violations can now migrate to other jurisdictions, can be rerouted. So I will give you the example uh, from a phenomenon that I call the indirect global accountability movement which has been the international effort to shed light upon and secure accountability for the U.S. rendition and torture program after 9-11. Claims that were brought in the United States as a result of this program uniformly were dismissed on threshold grounds, state secrets, qualified immunity, etc. But the proliferation of human rights fora and the fact that other countries were um, either acquiescing or actively participating in the program meant that claims that were not heard here have migrated elsewhere. And today we have seen decisions in multiple cases from both the European Court of Human Rights, the UN Committee Against Torture and the Human Rights Committee finding countries such as Macedonia, Sweden and Poland responsible for acts committed on their soil and their complicity um, in the CIA program. The fact that similar claims can be addressed in multiple fora and that multiple human rights bodies apply and interpret similar human rights norms makes it all the more pressing to build and strengthen linkages among these institutions in order to enhance the articulation and transfer of norms and to reinforce each other's imposition of hard and soft sanctions. A second example. On my first day at the UN Human Rights Committee, the Russian Federation appeared before the committee with a delegation of 47 members for its periodic oral dialogue. The agenda for the discussion included a swath of new laws adopted since President Putin returned to power in 2012 that are being used to suppress freedom of expression, and voices of social activists. Now, beginning in 2012, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe had asked the Venice Commission to provide opinion on the compliance of Russia's laws with fundamental human rights. These had included Russia's foreign agent law on NGOs, laws on treason, picketing, assembly, and extremism, and the infamous so-called propaganda of homosexuality laws. The Venice Commission had issued detailed opinions in each of these contexts, finding that the laws were overbroad, vague, and excessively restrictive on expressive activity, and recommending modification or repeal. Now, this is a classic situation where two institutions are addressing the identical problem involving the same country applying essentially identical norms and where ideally their efforts should be mutually reinforcing. To the extent that different bodies agree on the underlying norms, findings that are made by one body could be and should be embraced by the other, both to reinforce the message and to reduce duplication of effort. And yet it's a daunting task to accomplish this. When the European Court of Human Rights hears a case, the registry of the court produces a background memo that gathers the national, regional, and international doctrine and jurisprudence relevant to the issue from all around the world. And the court incorporates that doctrine in the body of its opinion. 
No other institutions have the resources to do that. The treaty bodies certainly do not. The Inter-American Court and the African Court and their commissions certainly do not. And so when we are confronted we, with a legal question, we either have to reinvent the wheel or we have to engage in a highly resource intensive, individualized and ad hoc effort to make that scrub um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Now, institutional connectivity can and should occur on many levels. We can connect the treaty body system better to each other. We can connect the treaty body system better to the Human Rights Council's special procedures, the special rapporteurs, and particularly the Universal Periodic Review. The Universal Periodic Review that all countries participate in every four years generates many recommendations to states, as do the treaty bodies. But ours are more specific because we are an expert legal body and they are political. We ought to develop a better means for, for reinforcing the recommendations of each of these bodies in the other fora. Likewise, connectivity with regional systems would involve promoting dialogue and exchange of jurisprudence between treaty bodies and regional human rights commissions and courts. This could produce greater awareness of jurisprudence and recommendations, allow sharing information about procedural best practices, make more conscious efforts to either reinforce the recommendations of the body or to avoid duplication. Connectivity to civil society plays an indispensable role because civil society is ultimately the grease that makes all of this work. Civil society is what carries information about human rights violations from countries to human rights bodies and what carries those, their recommendations from the human rights institutions back on the ground to educate the public and keep pressure on countries to comply with them. We could not function without civil society. Our activities are not self-executing. At most, we can create an opportunity for the engagement and vitalization of civil society. In this regard, I would like to note one extraordinary NGO named the CCPR Center, which has been funded by Open Society Foundations and European governments, including the Danish government, among others. It's a tiny NGO based in Geneva that is self-consciously designed to build the bridge between the Human Rights Committee and under-resourced states and civil society groups in the developing world. The CCPR Center records and webcasts state appearances, collects the jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee, provides technical support on reporting to states and NGOs, and when states like the Cote d'Ivoire or Cambodia appear before us, they bring NGOs from the countries to meet with us, and then they go back and help train those, those NGOs about how to implement our recommendations. They webcast our sessions so that local NGOs can hear the session, and they also fund the travel of committee members to countries as part of a follow-up effort. So in short, the CCPR Center serves as the vital connective tissue consciously between the committee and government and civil society in order to help us achieve that process of norm internalization. Technological connectivity. You can't talk about connectivity without addressing technology. The emergence of new technologies obviously can and should be harnessed to facilitate all of the above. Technology has created huge potential for the spread of human rights norms and arguments. It also makes the collection and recording of human rights violations much easier and much more immediate. From video recordings of police interrogations in the United States to real-time video recordings of human rights violations on smartphones abroad to the use of satellite imagery to find mass grave sites Technology is helping us record human rights violations. In Brooklyn, smartphone apps are being developed for human rights defenders that will allow them to record human rights violations and securely and confidentially upload them 
to the human rights cloud, time and geolocation stamped so that they can be permanent evidence of human rights violations. The app also allows the phone to be wiped clean if it's grabbed to protect the human rights defender. Technology can be very powerful indeed. And here I want to take a nod toward a new project that the Human Rights Institute has established, the Security Force Monitor. We're very excited about this. Still under development, but to be launched this spring, we're creating a web-based interactive platform that will provide detailed information based on maps regarding the organization and movements of police, military, and other security forces in countries around the world. The monitor will solve a major human rights investigation challenge by pulling together and making use of, in one place, the vast amount of publicly available information about the structure and movement of security forces. This means that if a violation occurs in a particular place, it will be possible to know which unit was located in that place. And therefore, we can come closer to linking perpetrators with violations. In addition to helping record and address violations, technology makes possible the comprehensive collection and sharing of jurisprudence among human rights bodies and allows human rights institutions to virtually connect in other meaningful ways. But we are not there yet. Although the UN has taken important strides with respect to the work of the treaty bodies, the UN Universal Database of Human Rights Jurisprudence remains cumbersome and incomplete. Although there's a UN plan to provide for webcasting of all treaty body sessions in all UN languages that would be preserved and word searchable, to date, we're still relying on the NGO CCPR Center to webcast occasional human rights treaty body sessions. So everything I've said so far has been designed to try to persuade you that bodies like the Human Rights Committee and the Venice Commission, on the one hand, do important work, but that their potential has been under-realized to date, and that the failure re rests in part in our collective failure to think through the best way to systematically integrate our disparate human rights mechanisms to heighten, in other words, connectivity. So what can universities do? I will, I will be quick. Um, first of all, universities are largely responsible for, tra for staffing the treaty body system. Academics are the people who can afford and who have the experience and commitments to take a part-time job that is unpaid that requires them to spend 12 to 15 weeks a year in Geneva, right? That's the treaty body job description. You're an academic or you're retired. That's actually not true because I have several members of my own committee here who are government officials and also wear that hat. I've already mentioned Columbia University's support for the harmonization of armed conflict Pro project, which is working on the issue of substantive connectivity, and I've mentioned the Security Monitor project, which is dealing with technology. With respect to institutional connectivity, universities can support comparative research into the procedures employed by different human rights mechanisms, comparative research into follow-up procedures, compare methodologies and best practices. They can support substantive norm transfer by compiling relevant jurisprudence and making it highly visible, accessible, and searchable. Columbia University is already doing this with its very important project on global freedom of expression. That project scrubs the world for national, regional, and international jurisprudence regarding freedom of expression, stores it on a database, provides periodic um, updates as to regarding new cases and hosts an annual conference that brings together advocates from different jurisdictions around the world to exchange their knowledge. We could further facilitate norm transfer and promote doctrinal coherence by expanding such a system, perhaps in cooperation with un other universities, to try to compile relevant jurisprudence from different bodies on a thematic basis. 
Hosting judicial trainings is another way that you make courts aware of international norms from other jurisdictions. Alice Henkin, Alice Henkin, who is here, understood this years ago when she, under the auspices of the Aspen Institute and with the support of the Ford Foundation, supported many, many judicial training seminars training U.S. judges in international and humanitarian law. And I'm delighted that this past November, the Human Rights Institute, together with NYU Law School, resurrected this judicial training seminar program uh, with the first in a number of years. We had 18 judges participate in a two and a half day seminar in which we trained them about the doctrine and institutions of the international human rights system and comparative approaches to national security jurisdiction laws in other jurisdictions. A second seminar will be held this November. Universities can promote transnational dialogue by bringing together the uh, participants from various human rights bodies. Transnational judicial dialogue has been um, a subject of academic attention for many years. And we now around the world have periodic conferences of constitutional courts that bring together judges from constitutional courts to share knowledge and expertise. We should be doing the same for human rights bodies. We need a similar transnational legal dialogue. We can help maximize the capacity of under-resourced courts and other human rights mechanisms by providing them with students and postgraduate support through fellowships, internships, and practicums. At the law school, I'm currently exploring a pilot project for a practicum that would engage students in the theory and practice of the work of the Human Rights Committee and other treaty bodies, and also pair each student with a member of the Human Rights Committee from the Global South who lacks access to students or other research support. Such relationships can be win-win-win. The students have consistent faculty supervision for their work. They are working and getting a first-hand opportunity, first opportunity to work with a human rights expert from halfway around the globe. And they're learning about and contributing to the work of an important human rights body. Finally, we can promote civil society connectivity by helping to disseminate information regarding regional and international human rights mechanisms to civil society activists and encourage their engagement with the human rights mechanisms. Through the Human Rights Institute's Bringing Human Rights Home Network, we engage over 800 US-based uh, civil society activists and human rights um, academics in educating them about the tools and doctrines of the various human rights mechanisms. We have a standing project to educate domestic civil society and government actors about the work of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission and Court. We engage with state and local government officials on the same issues. And our human rights clinic projects include work in Papua New Guinea, Peru, Chad, and the Central African Republic working with individuals and communities to understand and effectively access these human rights mechanisms. Every treaty body should have a CCPR center. Every treaty body should have a CCPR center. There should be something to consciously link and empower civil society's engagement with these mechanisms. So to close, it's 50 years we need to reflect backwards and forwards. Heightening substantive normative and institutional connectivity through transnational legal dialogue, facilitating connections to civil society, and deploying to new technologies all ultimately seek to advance the efficacy of our institutions in the struggle to promote the domestic internalization of human rights norms. As Robert Kennedy once observed, each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. 
It is the challenge of our age, the age of connectivity, to harness and channel the tiny ripples of hope that emanate from our dif disparate human rights institutions, to help build those ripples into a current capable of confronting the walls of oppression and resistance that daily challenge our world. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful lecture. We do have a few minutes uh, for questions. There are microphones in the aisles. If you have a question to pose, would you state your name and perhaps your affiliation? And following the question and answer session, uh, there will be a reception in Sarah's honor in the faculty room, which is located just behind this stage. Questions? Please. Yes. Hello, my name's Martin Flaherty, class of 88 of the law school, um, student of Lewis Hankin. I teach at Fordham Law School and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. Um, Sarah, you make a very compelling case for connectivity and a very exciting case for the role of universities. And I'm thinking of the step beyond that, which is problems of coordinating universities in doing this work so there's not replication uh, and uh, redundancy. So could you speak a little bit uh, to the extent you might have thought about that problem? It's a great question and it's actually one that I've confronted in a different context which is that a few years ago when, when Burma began opening up, many countries um, and many universities were interested in trying to provide support of various kinds, human rights education, training, so on and so forth, to Burma, um, with the result that they received this massive influx of offers of assistance with no means of managing them. And there was no international coordination, and I think a lot of time was wasted, and ultimately a lot of effort fell by the wayside because there was no real means to, uh, to accommodate it. I think, I think that's an extreme case. But I think the, the point is an important one. And um, in, in some ways, at least uh, within the US, I think universities are perhaps better connected than human rights institutions. I mean, we have the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law and AALS, and we have various um, interest groups where those conversations can occur as long as people are not um, you know, territorial about the project, and I would beg, um, just like it doesn't make sense for the treaty bodies to be territorial, universities also shouldn't be territorial about these kinds of efforts if we're all actually combined um, in, an, in, the same, in achieving the same goal. Thank you. Other questions? Hi there. Oh. Hi there. I'm Hunter Styers. I'm uh, with Columbia College. Uh, Professor Cleveland, thank you very much for coming today. At the moment, we are witnessing a growing challenge to the liberal world order that has uh, formed the backbone of the post-World War II international architecture. This challenge is being articulated most vociferously by three revisionist great powers, namely China, Russia, and Iran. And these countries seek to undermine the US-led international system with its emphasis on human rights by arguing that individual state sovereignty trumps all a concept intended to allow these states to crack down on dissent, silence civil society, and ensure that the security of their authoritarian regimes. What must the international human rights system do to ensure that it is ready to meet this challenge? And what do you see, what role do you see the hard and soft power capabilities of individual states supporting the international human rights architecture playing in supporting you in this effort? So Hunter, that's a big question. <laughs> Could I give another university lecture? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would caution, I guess, against uh, putting China, Russia, and Iran together. Um, I would also say that the problem isn't necessarily just limited to those countries, right? Mm -hmm. We have seen we have seen an emergence of the BRICS um, and, and other countries to challenge the sort of post-war world order. 
as, as you put it, and Russia has come back looking much more like a former Russia um, uh, in, in recent years since, since 2012. So um, I think it is imperative in that context for countries that are committed to the international system to work together um, and support the international institutions um, individually and collectively. Um, you know, it is not helpful for the UK to be threatening to withdraw from the European Convention and Court of Human Rights when that court is issuing repeated decisions against countries like Russia, right? It's destructive of the international system to have it fragment in that way. So I'm sure there are many other uh, ways to respond. I will say that the diversity of membership of the Human Rights Committee, my committee has members from Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Suriname, Argentina, Costa Rica, Japan, um, Uganda, Israel, the UK, France, etc. Right, Germany, um, Montenegro, Georgia. Uh, it's an extraordinarily representative international body, and I think it's very powerful when a body that is that diverse issues a unified message in, and a clear one in support of human rights when states appear before us. Thank you one very more much. Question, I think. Hi, Professor Cleveland. Thanks so much for your talk. I'm Jacob Bogart, a first year student at, Hi, Columbia, uh, at Columbia Law School. And my research assistant. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. I have, a, I have a question. In your speech on, I often hear a critique of human rights that one of the largest problems with these treaty body systems is that they are not enforceable and that they are toothless. Um, but in your speech, you seem to be um, alluding to that maybe that's not a problem and that mm. civil society is actually best positioned to be the ones emphasizing enforcement at the national level. However, how do you square that with countries that are particular, particularly repressive in the civil society space is continually um, cracked down on? I'm thinking of somewhere like China or Bahrain. You could think of any number of countries, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the human rights treaty body's recommendations are that. They are not legally binding on states. Even if they were, we wouldn't have any way to enforce them on states. And so it's, it's an important reality of the international system that it may matter less whether something is legally binding or not as to what the incentives are for a state to comply with the rule, right? Um, the treaty bodies will be effective in contexts in which either a government is itself potentially interested in doing better or is in a position where other external forces, be they domestic forces in society, economic, social, or otherwise, or external forces in the international community, will create the incentives for the government to want to do better. But we are not going to convince Assyria to do better, right? That, that job has to be left to harder forces than, than the tools that are available to the treaty body system. Once upon a time, I really believed um, only in hard law, right? And I only believed in courts. And I've moved off of that as a result of my work in the US government. Because when I was in the US government, I came to realize that the, that the imperative of having to report before these bodies and appear and explain yourself and being harassed by civil society and be harassed by the committee um, and the public shaming that occurs is actually motivating, right? It's actually motivating. It creates action forcing events. It creates opportunities where if there are people inside the government and outside the government who both want to push the government to a new position, it's an opportunity to accomplish that. And we see governments change positions before they come to us and after. So, you know, I think in the human rights toolbox, we need all the tools. This is only one of the tools, but I think it's a very important one. Thanks. Sarah, thank you for a wonderful lecture and for this exchange with, uh, with the audience. You're all invited to, uh, uh, to a reception afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.